Hello and welcome to this talk about delivering games in the cloud with ultra low latency over 5G networks. We've got a lot of really exciting stuff that we want to cover today, but before we get into that, a little bit about the speakers. First, my name is Nick Walsh and I'm a developer advocate here at Amazon Web Services, helping folks in the game tech space build amazing games on the cloud technologies. Joining me later in the talk is going to be Matt Lewis, principal developer advocate also here at Amazon Web Services. So let's sort of set the stage a little bit. What is network latency and why does it matter for games? Well, there are lots of different applications that all require an increasing amount of compute and storage closer to end users and devices. Whether this is IoT devices, applications running on mobile phones, or even game servers looking to be able to facilitate communication back and forth between clients, there is an increasing demand for data to be sent back and forth between clients and servers and have that data be transferred at a lower rate or at a lower latency. Uh, and games in particular are becoming increasingly online, meaning that they're trying to serve real-time content where bandwidth and, and latency in both directions becomes a significant uh, factor in the experience that your players have while playing a game. Uh, in addition to that sort of two-way communication, broadly games are becoming increasingly online, increasing uh, with respect to the amount of multiplayer components to them. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, any deficiencies in the networking side of your game result in real detriment in player experience. And I know I've said this a few times already, but this is really what I think it boils down to, player experience. At Amazon, we talk a lot about being customer obsessed and any game developer, if you ask them, they are going to be obsessed with player experience. Uh, so when we think about player experience when it comes to networking, uh, first that we wanna think about is maybe bandwidth. Uh, when we think about bandwidth from a game networking perspective, uh, this often means from a play for a player, their connection to the server. Uh, at scale, this means a little bit more than this though. Oftentimes a single game server will have to manage the throughput from a networking perspective of uh, the sheer amount of packets and data that they're sending out to very, a large number of clients or a very, very different clients. Uh, in this example I have in the picture in an MMORPG, it's significant that a, ban that a, a network can handle the bandwidth of sending out a large number of packets uh, for player locations and real-time information such that there isn't skipping uh, in, in, in you know, the movement of these players over time. Uh, now this has a compute element to it as well, but it becomes network constrained in a lot of different scenarios. Uh, essentially working under high load, bandwidth needs to be able to cover the max number of connections that players are going to be making to a game and to be able to distribute that data to all of your players on that given game session, instance, or server. Now, in addition to total bandwidth and a consistency of performance there, uh, low latency is also extremely important, uh, especially in real-time games, in particular shooters. Uh, solid and performant netcode is an important part of being able to uh, handle the packets and reconciling them on a master server and then figuring out exactly what the golden source of truth is with respect to your game state. But at any point in time, there is this bargaining or this understanding of um, the game server having to deal with players uh, having a discrepancy in uh, the, the com commands that they send and the what is ultimately executed on the server. Now, there's a lot of different ways to assess this, but at the end of the day, unless players are all playing on what is essentially zero or you know, single digit millisecond ping, uh, there needs to be netcode to reconcile this. Uh, I'm not gonna dive too deeply on how netcode can more or less uh, try to impact this. There are lots of really great talks though from GDC in the past that have. Uh, one, for example, we have here is from Thomas uh, Timothy Ford from the Overwatch team over at Blizzard talking about how they accomplish this. Uh, regardless of what your implementation is, essentially your netcode needs to sort of cycle through this event loop where you have the round trip latency for packets that are uh, sent to the server server, uh, they are read in, the latency is attempted to be corrected for, and a single tick happens on the server uh, to serve as the golden source of truth before the results are sent back to each player. When it comes back to player experience, players want to be able to commit actions on their own local client that can uh, be made actionable on the game server as closely to what they experienced. Ultimately, it doesn't feel good to have things happen to them that they could not have reacted to, and conversely, if they feel like they committed an action, they want to see that reflected in the game state. Uh, additionally, there's a really awesome talk from the folks over from uh, Halo Reach, uh, 
titled I Shot You First, Networking in the Gameplay in Halo Reach, um, where we have this networking complexity and bandwidth issue becoming O of N squared uh, in large player scenarios that explores sort of from a netcode perspective how this can be, uh, how this has been tackled in the past by some game, game uh, distributors. Okay, so when we think about connectivity over mobile networks today, in particular trying to serve content at the edge, uh, we find that 5G networks provide a lot of solutions to some of these previous problems that I've mentioned. Uh, when we were talking about 5G, we talk about a larger amount of bandwidth available on these networks by which we can use as the backbone for our games. And additionally, we can even have lower latency across these networks should these points of presences be, be um, integrated properly into our backbone and able to serve our applications directly at the edge without having to go through other bottleneck pieces of network infrastructure. So let's talk a little bit about how customers are deploying applications in AWS today. And this is going to give us a solid primer on how the benefits of 5G and in particular, a really awesome service called AWS Wavelength will help us improve the situation. Uh, so broadly, uh, we have the AWS global infrastructure here spanning a large 22 geographical regions, uh, 69 availability zones and 200 points of presences. Uh, now, if you're a game developer, this global network infrastructure is extremely important to you because it means that you can get your games distributed as closely to your players as possible for low latency uh, and for ensuring a, a high uh, quality of experience. Essentially, you don't have to lean as much on the netcode and you can have the server and infrastructure perform as you expect it to. Uh, this footprint is increasing uh, year over year, and in fact, I think since we've recorded this talk, we've actually rolled out a region there in South Africa, in Cape Town. Um, so constantly expanding. So as a developer, game developer trying to deploy your application on AWS, this is what that may look like. You choose maybe the nearest region closest to you to ensure that low latency. And you're going to have a variety of game clients, think of these as players, looking to connect to a game state. Let's say you have a choice to distribute where that application is delivered for those various clients. Um, so you may pick the closest uh, AWS region to deploy a game server in that region, in this case, US West 2 for this variety of, uh, of game clients. And now for each of these players, they're going to get a respective latency round trip for each of, uh, each of their packets. Uh, and we can see here the 15 milliseconds for some of the closer ones and 55 or 60 for some of the clients that are about at the midway point or maybe a little past this. Uh, so ultimately, we see a few different numbers here that become important. The, the max ping that a single player will get is around 60 milliseconds, uh, while our lowest is going to be 15 milliseconds, thus creating a 45 millisecond disparity between our two player groups. And ultimately, the average round trip latency here is going to be in the ballpark of 35 40 milliseconds. Um, again, this is a pretty standard sort of scenario with a fairly uh, evenly distributed uh, set of players here in, the, in this group connecting to, again, a best case scenario region. But there's a lot that actually goes on with deploying your application within that region, even from a networking perspective. Uh, to tell us a little bit more about this, I'm going to pass it off to Matt, who's going to dive deeper on networking uh, at the application level here for Amazon Web Services. All right. Thanks, Nick. Um, let's take a closer look at what a wavelength architecture looks like. But before we do that, we have to actually dive into Amazon VPC in the region. And we'll talk about what a, an Amazon VPC architecture looks like. So when we've got um, EC2 inside the region and things like Amazon VPC, and a VPC is a region level construct, and we're going to build out our architecture here. And this is uh, before Wavelength even existed. Um, so we've got a VPC, we've got a CEDA address range, we've got our availability zones, subnets, and then we deploy EC2 compute inside subnets, inside the availability zones, inside of the VPC. Now we've got um, services that sit outside of that VPC, so um, S3, DynamoDB, Lambda, etc., even the public internet. And um, you'll notice here as we build, out, build up our architecture, we're going to add a whole bunch of different types of gateways to the VPC, and um, we'll see what that looks like from a traffic flow perspective. And we're really taking a networking look at what a VPC architecture looks like. Okay, so we have um, route tables for our subnets, 
and um, you can configure route tables for, for multiple different subnets. We've got our internet um, sitting out in, on the uh, top right there and also public services like S3 and DynamoDB, etc. But then we'll start adding things like an internet gateway so we can have internet access for our VPC, NAT gateways um, or NAT instances, uh, a VPC endpoint so we can have access privately to S3 or DynamoDB, um, VGWs VPN using VPN or Direct Connect to allow us to connect to um, your on-premises. So we're, we're building out our, our VPC architecture here and we're adding all of these different components that allow us to connect to different things. So to connect to things like S3 or the public internet or our on-premises. Um, so then we have VPC peering so we can connect multiple VPCs together. And this is getting pretty, pretty complex here with a lot of different moving parts. Um, so we, we also have Transit Gateway, which allows you to connect um, up to 5,000 VPCs together. Private Link, um, allowing you to connect privately to services that you front and also um, other Private Link enabled services. VPC Flow Logs for metadata of traffic going in and out of the VPC. And then lastly, Global Accelerator. So what you see here is um, it's really a combination of a whole bunch of different things that go into a customer's VPC architecture. So things like internet gateways, VPC endpoints, private link. Um, not every customer is using everything and has a crazy architecture like this, um, but customers do use a combination of these different components and and your VPC deployment will probably use some flavor of, of some of these components that you see here. So now we've got a base level of what a VPC architecture looks like. Um, how does Wavelength help with this? And, and what does a Wavelength architecture look like? Well, first we need to cover off the Wavelength benefits. So, um, You'll hear me mention a lot here that when we use wavelengths, you'll get lower latency. Um, so what we're actually doing with wavelengths is we're taking compute like we saw in the VPC architecture and we're moving it into the CSP or the communication service providers network. <clears throat> and what that's going to allow us to do is have lower latency from compute inside the a wavelength zone. And we'll talk about what a wavelength zone looks like in a minute. Um, and we can basically have lower latency all the way through to an end user that's connected to the um, mobile network, which then also gives us higher bandwidth as well. Latency and bandwidth are, are two interrelated things and um, definitely something that Wavelength um, brings to the party here. Um, so also when we're deploying Wavelength and VPC architectures that use Wavelength, um, we're using the same constructs as we, as we just saw in the VPC architecture. Now it's a little bit different and we'll dive into that, but from a development perspective, you actually get the same experience. So it's a consistent experience using the same SDKs, the same APIs, the same CLI um, across through the AWS region, all the way through to the Wavelength zone as well. Um, Additional to the development uh, experience, um, you also get the benefits of using AWS and using the AWS cloud. So um, you get things like no capital um, costs, pay-as-you-go pricing, auto-scaling, so scaling up instances and scaling down instances as you need. Um, lastly, ubiquity. So we're looking at deploying wavelength zones all across the globe. So you can provide ubiquitous access to compute that's running inside a wavelength zone and um, your end users, and regardless of whether they're in EMEA or Asia Pac or in the United States. And we've actually partnered with Verizon here in the US, but we've also partnered with um, Vodafone in EMEA as well. So we'll be deploying wavelength zones in um, our partner CSP networks, which will give you that ubiquitous access for all of your users. <coughs> Okay, so we've talked about some of the benefits of Wavelength and we've talked about what a VPC architecture looks like in the region, but what does a Wavelength architecture look like? Okay, so we have our, our base level of VPC before and, and we don't have all of the, the you know, components that we had in the, the previous advanced architecture. But here again, we've got availability zones, we've got our instances, and 
when it comes to wavelengths, we're actually taking this VPC that operates inside the region and we're extending that through to what we call a wavelength zone. So the VPC actually spans both the region and the wavelength zone. So now we can spin up a wavelength subnet and spin up some instances, instance Y and instance Z in this case. And these instances are in the same VPC as other instances inside the region. <clears throat> so because we're using the same construct, we're using the um, VPC here, you get access to the same VPC components like route tables, security groups, network ACLs, etc. So all of those VPC constructs that you know and love, you can also use those in the VPC that's extended out to an AWS Wavelength zone as well. So the same networking constructs as the AWS region. Now, if we take this one step further, Instances inside the wavelength zone can talk to each other, but they can also communicate with instances in the public, oh, sorry, in your subnets inside the VPC inside the region. Okay, so we have the um, instances inside the wavelength subnets that can communicate with instances inside the subnets inside the same VPC in the region. So here we've got our route table and we've got our local route inside the VPC, which allows everything to talk to everything else inside the region. We've got our internet gateway. Um, again, we've got services that sit inside the region like S3 and DynamoDB. And you'll notice we build out our route table here on the right hand side for our Wavelink subnet. And we're building access to things like transit gateway, things like VPC peering, VGWs, etc. And so our route table is really going to determine how we can communicate across the, the VPC from the wavelength zone to the region. Now, one of the main reasons why you would use a wavelength zone is to connect through the carrier network or the CSP through to a 5G network, for example, and users that sit within that 5G network. So what we needed to do when we built uh, wavelengths was to build a wavelength carrier gateway. So the carrier gateway is a new type of gateway, um, just like an internet gateway or a, a, a VGW or a transit gateway. Um, a carrier gateway is going to allow you to have access natively through to the carrier network. So for that, we build a route again to our um, routes that are within the carrier network via the carrier gateway. And we take on what's called a carrier owned IP. So that's gonna be what your instances inside the wavelength zone are represented as in the um, CSP network. So once we've built our route, we now have connectivity through to the carrier network. Okay, let's talk about wave, AWS wavelength use cases. So you've heard me mention latency a couple of times here, and, and latency is really one of those really important things when it comes to network communication. So Wavelengths is able to give you ultra low latency compute as the compute is now sitting at the edge of the um, 5G network. So in this case, we've actually got a, a small graph here. So um, you can see the purple color here is latency, and we've got an average site latency here, which is the peak you see. But you also notice as we increase the latency, we also see an increase in the site abandoned rate. So the turquoise color you see here are users that are abandoning their, their um, request to a site. Now, obviously that's not a, not a good thing. So um, basically when you increase latency, in this case in turn, you're decreasing customer satisfaction because if you wait a long time for an application or a public web app or something like that, um, obviously you get to some point where you just give up. And so <clears throat> that's what we're seeing here where we're increasing the latency, we're seeing an increase in site abandonment. So wavelengths can really help with that by moving compute closer to the edge of the network and decreasing latency and therefore increasing cus customer satisfaction as well. All right, another use case here um, is emerging interactive applications. So when we've got a, a mobile tablet or a phone or something similar that has a restricted or um, limited amount of compute, um, and we want to run things like virtual reality or real-time rendering um, that are quite compute intensive um, operations, 
that's where Wavelengths really comes into its own. So um, the mobile tablet or device can use this compute that's sitting close to the edge of the network. And um, we've reduced our latency from, from the compute to the end user, and we're able to do things like virtual reality and real-time rendering. Another use case here is edge data processing. So very similar to um, doing things like virtual reality and, and other things, you're doing data processing. And in this case, you might have smart cities or IoT devices that have constrained compute. And you can actually do the um, edge data processing that's required in a wavelength zone, which is sitting actually quite close to your smart city edge or your IoT devices. Now the last use case I've got here is a machine learning inference at the edge. So we've actually got a um, Amazon delivery robot and that robot might need to do things like artificial intelligence or um, machine learning to determine uh, the best path to a house or if there's objects, it can do object avoidance. Now, again, we're operating in a constrained environment from a compute perspective. And so we don't have um, things like AI and um, machine learning that can operate in the actual device itself. So having wavelength zones sitting at the edge of the network reducing that latency from the wavelength zone to the um, delivery robot in this case is enabling um, things like this, this use case and having CPU memory and power close to that um, edge allowing for these operations. Okay, so we've, we've talked about wavelength zones and um, what they really look like in some of the use cases and why you would use wavelength. But one of the things that goes together very nicely with Wavelength is actually 5G. So high bandwidth mobile networks where we can run away, have a Wavelength zone that sits near the edge of that network and then users have high unblocked bandwidth towards that Wavelength zone. So um, that's really where 5G comes in. So what is 5G? Well, to talk about 5G, we need to um, just do a little bit of a history lesson here. So. If we start in uh, the 1980s, and I'm going to do uh, increments by uh, each decade, so we start with 1G. And 1G was really analog um, voice, and you had these, these mobile phones that were huge. You'd carry around almost a briefcase that, that had a phone in it. And um, it was extremely convenient at the time, but it was all analog and really low data rates. Then if we fast forward 10 years to the 1990s, where we saw 2G, we saw this uptick of um, digital voice capacity. So everything was going from analog to digital and you saw more bandwidth, but really things didn't start to um, really take off until the 2000s when we had things like 3G. And I remember my, my first 3G phone where um, I was browsing the internet on my, my flip phone and it was amazing, it was unbelievable. Um, so in the 2000s with 3G, we really started to see voice and data um, operate together on a mobile network. Um, then when we move uh, forward into the 2010s, um, we started to see 4G and 4G was where um, we really started to see these higher bandwidths over a mobile network. So um, it's really broadband data and video. And now we're in the 2020s or 2020 right now. Um, so we're 10 years past um, the 4G uh, deployments that happened. And 5G is really something that, that we're looking to, to enable that next generation of mobile access. So to talk about um, what 5G will bring to, to this equation, we need to talk about uh, what I call the, the 5G triangle of success. So when we look at uh, 5G drivers, it's really a combination of between high capacity, ultra low latency and massive connectivity. So when we think about these three things um, and from a high capacity perspective, we're looking at peak data rates of 20 gigabits per second download and 10 gigabits per second upload, which is unbelievable. Now that translates into a, a user experience data rate of around 100 megabits per second down and 50 megabits per second up, which is still amazing from a, an end user mobile perspective. Now from a low latency perspective, 
The idea with 5G is we're actually splitting out the control plane and the user plane or the data plane. And so the user plane then is able to get latencies between five and 10 milliseconds and the control plane is able to get latencies between 10 and 20 milliseconds. So um, really low latencies compared to what we're used to with a 3G or a 4G network. Now from a massive connectivity perspective, um, the density of devices with 5G is really expected to take off. So we're looking at about a million devices per square kilometer. So one of the questions you might wonder is, well, how does 5G achieve this? So we, we know what the drivers are, but how do we actually do that from a technology perspective? Well, there's three main components. So the first is advanced wireless technologies. So to start with, um, with 5G, cell sizes are decreasing. And what that actually does is allows a cell to cover a smaller area instead of um, a square kilometer or two square kilometers, um, we're talking about um, hundreds of square meters. And then we can have uh, better access to users within that smaller area to the smaller cells. So more cells equals um, better access for users. Then we're looking at um, multiple input, multiple output antennas. So um, these antennas or um, basically the next generation of antennas that we'd use with 5G offer much better data rates compared to their 4G and 5G counterparts. And lastly, from an advanced wireless technology perspective, um, using higher ends of the mobile spectrum. So this is gonna give us much greater bandwidth um, when we talk about mo using mobile spectrum. The second here is virtualization. So we're, with 5G, we're seeing this move from dedicated hardware. And um, as a network engineer, I used to run around data centers and install um, mobile equipment actually for, for a large mobile provider. And it was all about dedicated appliances and these really big devices that would support a lot of users, but it was dedicated hardware that had a specific function or a specific role. With 5G, we're looking at moving to virtualized platforms. So taking a network function that's now virtualized and can run on a server. Um, and so you don't have to deploy these dedicated big pieces of hardware. You can deploy these functions on um, servers and also split out the control plane and the data plane or the control plane and the user plane. Lastly, moving network components and applications closer to users. So you've got a user that is using a mobile network instead of them reaching out and connecting to a service that's running in a, an AWS region or maybe even a data center further away, like 100 milliseconds away. Um, the idea is moving all of that stuff closer to the user. So um, that's going to enable 5G even further. So along that um, grain, we start thinking about edge computing. So edge computing is really where we're putting compute at the edge of the network. And, and that's really where 5G and wavelengths really come together. So when we think about the end-to-end -end network and we look at an AWS region, and then we've got a mobile um, user on the right-hand side here connected through the, um, the mobile network, through to the communication service providers um, network or the CSP network, through a transit peering point, through over the internet, to an AWS region, when we're going from point A to point B, or from point B to point A, we're looking at about 100 milliseconds of round trip time. So the round trip time here um, is actually quite high. And if we remember that graph that we had, as the round trip time or the latency increases, um, customer satisfaction also decreases, or site abandonment rates increase. So when we start thinking about having compute at the edge, something with something like a wavelength zone, we've got point B still being the, the mobile user, the subscriber here, and then we've got point A now operating within the CSP network. So now we're looking at a round trip time of around 10 milliseconds, which is much, much lower than 100 milliseconds. Now, one thing that happens when you reduce the distance 
the data transfer needs to happen across is you not only get lower latency, but you get lower jitter. And jitter is the variance in latency. So um, when latency, when you have variable latency, some applications actually don't function quite well. Um, so when you're reducing that latency, you're reducing the distance that that data communications needs to travel. You've now got compute at the edge of the um, mobile network. You're also reducing jitter as well. Now, if we um, have something like a, a um, security feed or a multiple 24 by seven video streams, um, normally, if you're sending those video streams all the way back to an AWS region, for example, you need to support that bandwidth all the way through to the region. Now, in this case, you could deploy some compute at a wavelength zone. You could do your video processing in the wavelength zone, which is closer to the edge, and then send a compressed video stream from the wavelength zone up into the AWS region. So you don't need that full amount of bandwidth all the way through to the AWS region. Alrighty, let's, let's talk a little bit more about wavelength zones and, and what they kind of look like and where they sit. So when we have a wavelength zone, it's sitting inside the CSP network, and that's really what wavelength is constituted of. So we've deployed this technology, this AWS deployment in the CSP network that you can then use as part of your VPC, and it looks similar to another availability zone. So a wavelength zone is where we're taking that same AWS designed infrastructure for what we use in our regions, and we're deploying it in um, our CSP partners networks. So we're hosting it within a CSP partner network. We're also managing the wavelength zone. So it is a managed service. We're managing the hardware and all of the monitoring and maintenance and patching and everything that goes into, into managing that hardware. We're managing that from with the same constructs and tools that we AWS use inside the region. However, the wavelength zone is also integrated into the CSP, which is connected to a 5G network, for example, in this case. So what's unique about a wavelength zone? Well, when we use a wavelength zone versus deploying maybe some servers that sit at the edge of a, of a CSP network, using wavelength, you're using the same single pane of management for wavelength as you do services in the region. So the same tools that you use, the same CLI, the same console, you can use to connect uh, or use um, to deploy things inside the wavelength zone as well. Now, when we deploy a wavelength zone and as a customer, you use that wavelength zone, you get the same operational consistency um, as you do in the region. So we're managing that as a fully managed service. And the intention here is to give you the same pace of innovation that you get inside the AWS region. So I'm sure as AWS users, you're, you've um, being used to the pace of innovation that we operate here at AWS and, and how many services we've launched over the, the last couple of years. The idea is to take a wavelength zone and offer that at the edge of a mobile network, but that's also going to give us um, the same pace of innovation as an AWS region. Lastly here, failover from an AWS wavelength zone because you've got that VPC connectivity. Um, so failover to an AWS region um, is something that you can pretty easily do as well. Okay, so here we've got um, our AWS regions. Uh, so we've got our four, just like Nick covered earlier, and we've got a wavelength zone um, that sits outside of the region, but connected back to the AWS region. So we can see that the wavelength zone is, as we described before, connected to the internet and also connected to the mobile network. Now, the intention is not to just have one wavelength zone. We're looking at deploying many wavelength zones, both across the domestic United States and globally. So when you want to use compute at the edge, you can use any one of these wavelength zones globally, which is awesome. It's amazing. Okay, so let's talk about using a wavelength zone. Now, if we're deploying an application in a, in a wavelength zone, it's very similar to like we showed before. We've got an AWS region, we've got our wavelength zone, we've got the control management and monitoring between the region and the wavelength zone. And so we're deploying compute inside the VPC and also inside the wavelength zone as well. The VPC is extended from the region to the wavelength zone. 
and we have our carrier gateway that allows us to access both the 5G network and also the internet. So you might have servers that operate inside the internet that you need connectivity to, and also S3 um, as a public service. Now, if we take this architecture and have a look at what it looks like from maybe a, a game application perspective. So in this case, we've got um, maybe some player state um, functioning in the region using maybe DynamoDB and Lambda. We've got some compute operating in the wavelength zone out near the edge. We might be storing game runtimes inside S3 inside the region. We've got a mobile user that comes in, uh, reaches out to a service discovery service running inside the region, again, using DynamoDB or Lambda. And that user is then directed to a local wavelength carrier gateway, which then um, sends them to the local compute to them. So based on latency here, we can have um, this local data processing, et cetera, functioning close to the mobile user. And pretty awesome stuff. All right. So now I'm going to actually hand it back to Nick and Nick's going to dive into uh, what Wavelength looks like in practice as well. Over to you, Nick. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that really deep dive on the AWS networking stack in particular, how it actually relates to deploying gaming applications. Um, we're really excited about Wavelength local zones, and I actually want to show you how that affects the player experience, something that we started off with at the top of today's talk, because I know a lot of the nuts and bolts around the architecture can be a bit hairy, but when you see how it affects the player experience, this becomes very clear how this is going to benefit your players. So let's take a look. So going back to our scenario that we posed before, uh, four moderately distributed players uh, across the mid middle and, and coastal parts of the United States. Now, in the status quo, we have these AWS regions where you would ideally, as a game developer, deploy to the closest one being US West 2. Uh, but with the advent of wavelength local zones, you can choose the best minimal latency uh, locals, uh, local zone to deploy your game server to to offer the best experience to your players. Uh, ideally, one would be located somewhere here in between all of the players for the given session. And so now we can see that the latencies look much different. Um, we see here going around the circle 15, 15, 15, and 30. Uh, and this, this actually has a handful of very tangible benefits for the player. Uh, first is that the max single round trip latency is only 30 milliseconds. Uh, ultimately, what this means is that there, for a single player, uh, the highest amount of, of, of degradation if you um, you know, we're not leaning heavily on your on your net code to be able to perform, uh, you know, accurate, effective and delightful fixes uh, is that someone will be either very behind the game server or their actions will often be not reflected on the game state uh, in real time as they're happening for that given high latency player. So we drop that maximum ping down to 30 milliseconds from 60 prior, which essentially cuts it in half. Uh, ultimately, we see that the average is still around 15 to 20, and the minimum is around 15. So we're essentially narrowing the band and reducing it at the top end by being able to have this uh, wavelength local zone hosting our game session much closer to where your players are actually located. Uh, so by the numbers, let's take a look at here, comparing sort of apples to apples. We have in the closest AWS region there on the left-hand side some of the numbers from before, the numbers on the right hand side being the uh, typical case scenario for a wavelength local zone with some of these uh, closely or moderately distributed players. Um, and so we see those sort of top level goals here. Again, cutting down the maximum latency, so improving the worst case performance. If you're you know, thinking about traditional DevOps, this could be like the P99 latency for some of your players. Um, now further, we're reducing the latency band ultimately um, by cutting down the minimum and maximum, uh, the range between those. What this means is that your net code is having to work and craft the player experience are in a much narrower scope. Uh, so you, essentially your game will behave and be easier to test around a narrower band for player experiences. Uh, oftentimes you'll see a lot of uh, sort of errant behavior that's hard to account for or to test for in, in some of the high latency scenarios, um, and this helps to reduce that. Uh, and lastly, you're simply cutting the average latency in half across the board. Um, obviously, we will mention solving the worst case scenario, but I, uh, for all of your other players in that same game session, reducing their latency is only going to be a net benefit for them as well.
So let's take one more scenario where we have a lot of, uh, or a handful of different players and clients, uh, and they exist, again, not immediately near one of the existing AWS regions, uh, but they may be very close to one another. Now, while they're very close to another, if they can't connect directly over an intranet, uh, as most cloud hosted games cannot, or, or most games that are multiplayer hosted on, on the internet today cannot, um, they would still have the average latency from each of them having to connect directly to the server on the nearest AWS region. Again, probably being US West one or two. Um, however, with a wavelength hosted zone, uh, their latency is going to be bound uh, by the closest wavelength zone and no longer the closest region. Again, with wavelength zones hosted directly in data centers on the 5G backbone from major telecom providers, uh, the likelihood that a wavelength zone can be significantly closer to where your players are is extremely high. Uh, so in this scenario, we find that these players that while they're very close together, can also be close to a wavelength zone, getting latencies as low as five, seven, eight milliseconds here up until maybe around 15. Uh, and the numbers uh, trend even further downward across the total experience uh, uh, with respect to latency. Uh, our maximum single round trip latency can be as low as 15. Again, that's constrained by the furthest player from that local zone. Uh, but additionally, our variance is going way down and our average round trip latency can be as low as you know 10 milliseconds in a scenario like this. Uh, by the numbers, we compare this again to the sort of before and after with regions and wavelength local zones. Uh, and we can see, uh, again, for this example, with these types of player schemas, again, they may your mileage may vary depending on your player base, but numbers in the order of 70, almost 80% reduction in mean round trip latency and reduction in latency for the highest latency player. Uh, so if you're probably wondering who's using this in practice, well, I have a really great example here, and that's Bethesda Softworks. Uh, known for a lot of different games, the one in particular where they're leveraging wavelength local zones is actually to stream Doom from a cloud game server to client devices. I mentioned before that this bi-directional traffic and low latency on both ends is very important, uh, not just for being able to stream the data down to the client, but to also be able to take those inputs to actually execute the game ticks up on the server where the game is actually running. Um, so again, they want low latency, they want high bandwidth so that they can transmit 1080p and high resolution images uh, and video essentially back and forth. They want low jitter so this doesn't become a jarring experience for the player. Uh, and again, because it's streaming, they can't be buffering the video. Uh, this performance and the, the networking really needs to be rock solid. Additionally, they have players all over the world, so they need to be able to have a solution and an infrastructure that supports uh, this very same geographic diversity that their players exhibit. So from a hardware approach, there's a lot of really unique things that they've done over there. Um, I won't dive too deep into this. There's actually an entire talk from reInvent where some of the folks from Bethesda dive a bit deeper on this. But essentially, there's everything from the frames that are generated by the game server, uh, a rendered frame, uh, there is also the encoding of that to be sent over the network. Again, these are high resolution images and videos essentially that need to be streamed down to the player. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting uh, magic that they've, they've implemented there in order to push off some of the um, filtering and some of the uh, heavy effects to the client actually, so that this streaming for low latency actually becomes possible. Uh, these are often filters that are applied to the entire image and don't need the GPUs that may be present on the game server. Um, this compressed video output is sent down to the client device, it's decoded, players take actions and they submit those all to the game server. And this happens in a continuous loop. Now to see this in action, we can actually take a look at this video to see what it looks like uh, for Bethesda to use Orion, their proprietary uh, implementation here on Wavelength Local Zones. So here we can see with Orion on, uh, it's extremely smooth. You see that as the player moves around, these updated frames are sent down in real time for the location. Uh, and with the deltas in the environment, this happens uh, and doesn't have ocular occlusions. Likewise, when we have the Orion turned off, uh, you can see that as the player moves around in the world, uh, there's jitter or inconsistencies in, in how that data is being streamed back down. So with a solid backbone in conjunction with uh, some really uh, innovative um, implementations on the encoding and decoding side, uh, it can make what is otherwise very difficult possible here for real-time high fidelity game streaming.
questions, you can actually stop by the Ask the Experts section uh, to speak with AWS technical experts. Uh, I may be hanging out there and some other folks, they'll be able to get those questions answered that you may be, ha may be having. Uh, and lastly, for more details on uh, today's session on wavelength and delivering content with over 5G networks, check out the Resource Center for everything from the slide deck that we gave today, uh, further links to this video on demand after the fact, or any of the links that we had mentioned in today's talk. Again, thank you for tuning in and enjoy the rest of the event.